Okay, so good morning, everyone. And uh, it's lovely to see so many people here on a Saturday morning when you could all be cozily in bed. So that, that fills me with enthusiasm that so many people are interested that they drag themselves out of bed on a Saturday morning to come and listen to me talk about witches. With, um, so um, my name is Miranda Corcoran and I am a lecturer currently in 21st century literature in the Department of English in UCC. And though my, my, my technical designation is lecturer in 21st century literature, really I'm just obsessed with all things kind of gothic, science fiction and spooky in general, hence the talk that we're doing today. And this talk grew very much out of my own realization that the teenage witch is a strangely ubiquitous cultural artifact or archetype. They seem to be absolutely everywhere in our popular culture. We find teen witches in Arthur Miller's 1953 play, The Crucible, in young adult novels like Elizabeth George Spears, The Witch of Blackbird Pond, and Lo Lois Duncan's Summer of Fear. We find witches on television shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and uh, The Vampire Diaries and American Horror Story Coven. We also find witches, of course, in cinema, or teen witches in cinema in movies like the late 80s very cheesy comedy Teen Witch, in the iconic 90s horror film The Craft, and of course in Robert Eggers' folk horror masterpiece The Witch. The most famous Teen Witch, I think the, the icon of Teen Witches, Sabrina Spellman, has existed in numerous different um, incarnations since her debut in Archie Comics in the early 1960s. And since then she's appeared in um, in, as I said, her own comedic comic book, in a Saturday morning cartoon series, in a hugely popular 90s sitcom, and most recently she has appeared in the highly stylized, very gothic Netflix series, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which is itself based on a comic book series of the same name. So teen witches are a pretty pervasive cultural archetype. And a couple of years ago, I found myself wondering why this archetype, why this particular trope, the teenage witch, is so popular? What is it about teenage girls that has led them to be so commonly associated with witches in the media? Do teen witches reflect cultural anxieties about adolescent girls? Do they reflect notions of rebellion, fears about burgeoning sexuality? And is the teen witch a problematic archetype, one that frames teen girls as inherently disruptive or is it a potentially empowering trope? The, um, the film producer, Douglas Wick, who was the producer on The Craft, for example, said that the idea for the film came to him when he realized he wanted to do something. He wanted to create a film that was all about young girls coming into their power, coming into their strength as women. So I think the teen witch archetype can be both problematic and empowering and pretty much everything in between. So I started looking into this topic, and as I did so, one thing that really grabbed me, one thing that I found really fascinating, was that the teenage witch, as a cultural trope, emerges in American popular culture at almost exactly the same moment that the teenager manifests as a new and highly visible demographic in the post-war years. So I've since written a book on the subject and it's, it's currently gone back to the peer reviewer. So, you know, fingers crossed for me there. Um, and what I've really focused on is where the teenage witch comes from, um, what she means and how she's evolved over the 70 plus years since her creation. So obviously the topic of teen witches is a big topic. As I said, I wrote a whole book about it. Um, so there's a lot to say, but for this particular conversation, for this class today, I'm going to limit myself to discussing the origins of the teen witch. So I'm going to be focusing primarily on American culture from the period of the 1940s through to the 1960s. So we're going to look at where the teen witch comes from and some early versions of the character. But I think based on that, based on discussing the origins of the teen witch, I think we can from there on or you as an audience can extrapolate a little bit about how she develops and maybe draw some conclusions or parallels of your own between contemporary teen witches as seen in The Craft and The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina 
and the original team witches that we get in the middle part of the 20th century. So for the purposes of today's talk, since we don't have all day, I'm going to be dividing this uh, class into three key sections. I'm going to begin by talking about the invention of the American teenager, the birth of the American teenager, and basically the construction of the teenager as a distinct social category, which is something that happens in the 1940s and the 1950s. From there, I'm going to move on to talk about a book that I see as being essentially responsible for creating the teen witch archetype, for essentially conflating witchcraft and contemporary adolescence. And that's Marion L. Starkey's massively influential at the time, but now largely forgotten study, The Devil in Massachusetts, a modern inquiry into the Salem witch trials. And that was published in 1949, just as the teenager was emerging as a cause of, in, as a cause of concern and a source of interest in American culture. And then lastly, I'm going to finish up by talking about some early iterations of the teenage witch, drawn largely from works uh, produced in the 1950s and the 1960s. So works that are engaged often directly and often explicitly with Starkey's original work. So one thing that people are always surprised about when I talk about my research is how new the teenager is. How, and particularly how new the term teenager is. It's actually very, very, it's a very recent coinage. So the word teenage and the term teenager only emerged as a way of describing young people between the ages of 13 and 19 in 1944. So towards the end of the Second World War. Prior to the 1930s, most at American adolescents, particularly working and middle-class adolescents, worked either in factories or on farms as laborers or in the home. And they generally lacked a clear sense of demographic unity. They lacked an identity or a culture of their own. Most people viewed young people or youths as adults in training. They weren't viewed as a separate cultural demographic. So, Young people in the labor force in particular were rarely understood or described in, um, as teenagers or even as adolescents, because the idea of adolescence was one that was primarily reserved for high school students. So young people with the kind of financial and familial support that allowed them to continue their education beyond the primary level. This, however, began to change with the Great Depression, the general lack of jobs, the lack of employment opportunities during that period in the early 1930s meant that young people were encouraged to stay in education, thereby freeing up jobs for adults or just ensuring that they weren't, you know, hanging around doing nothing. So once young people began to remain in school past the primary level, the concept of adolescence expanded. It was no longer reserved for the wealthy, but it began to apply to young people from a diverse range of backgrounds. The historian Grace Palladino, I think, puts this very well. She says that in the rush to the classroom, the movement to the classroom that occurred in the 1930s, adolescents had become an age group and not just a wealthy social class. And this shift helped to create the idea of a separate teenage generation. When a teenage majority spent the better part of their day in school, they learned to look to one another and not to adults for information, advice, and approval. And of course, this idea of young people looking to one another instead of adults for advice and approval was one key source of concern um, that surrounded the teenager when it, when it first came into being as a social category. So by the end of the 1930s, secondary education had become the norm rather than the exception for young people. And by 1939, around 75% of America's adolescent population was enrolled in high school. And adolescence begins to develop into the concept of the teenager very quickly once we hit the 1940s. In the 1940s, following the US entry into the Second World War, the economy, of course, boomed and, sorry, the economy boomed and 
many teens re-entered the workforce during those years. And obviously some of them did drop out of school in order to work full time, but many others acquired part-time jobs in the evenings and on weekends. And the financial freedom that came as a result of working part-time, earning extra money, the ability to earn their own money, and of course, to decide how to spend it, that was key to the development of the teenager as a distinct social demographic. So Ileana Nash, for example, notes that the ability to remain in school while also earning a wage or a regular wage allowed students both the financial means and the time to participate in the leisure culture of high school peer groups. So again, the two things that really sort of form the teenager as a concept in American culture are secondary education, which, pu which pushes a bunch of young people together so that they can form their own distinct peer group and money, the finances to essentially uh, become a consumer demographic and to create their own identity, largely based on consumer goods like music, um, fashion, and so on. So when the war ended, obviously, and the economy continued to thrive, middle-class parents found themselves better able to support their teenage children. They were able to buy them fashion clothes and records and cars and things like that. Many parents at this time also began to give their children a regular allowance. And this idea of an allowance or pocket money, money that was regularly given to young people, this allowed them again a degree of freedom because they were given the opportunity to decide how they would spend their money. So although teenagers at this time, as they were emerging, were largely defined by their economic role, they were, they were after all, a very lucrative consumer base. Post-war teens also sought to create their own cultural identities, their own separate generational identity, apart and distinct from the identities of their parents and of their families. And of course, this does lead to the idea of teenagers as troublemakers or potentially oppositional as they begin to view themselves not just as a consumer group, but as a distinct demographic and attempt to create their own cultural identity. So the broader cultural attitude towards teenagers at this time was generally quite ambivalent. On the one hand, teenagers were viewed quite positively they were seen as being the fruits of America's new economic prosperity. These young people who had sufficient money and leisure time to create an identity based almost entirely on both peer groups and rabbit consumption. That was a sign that America was doing well. It was doing well financially, socially, um, culturally. On the other hand though, there was something about teenagers that made them seem a bit strange, a bit bizarre, a little bit uncanny they tended to be perceived as cliquish. Their slang was seen as bizarre, almost like a secret code or language. Their music was riotous and their fashion and fads were seen as strange and off-putting by adults. So in some ways they seemed fundamentally alien to adult observers. So there was very much a dichotomy in terms of how teenagers were viewed or a sense of ambivalence. On the one hand, they represented America's post-war success, but on the other hand, they were strange and often somewhat threatening to the broader culture. One researcher at the time um, who was observing peer group interactions amongst teens in the American Midwest emphasized in particular the cultish aspects of their socialization. And in his work, he noted that while peer groups, teen gangs or groups, have no official rules for membership, they do have a sort of unspoken set of rules and an unspoken emphasis on homogeny, on homogenous behavior. So this researcher points out that while teen peer groups have no official rules for membership, each one has a more or less common set of values which determines who will be admitted, what the group does, and how it will censure or punish those who do not abide by its rules. So one thing that certainly disturbed adult viewers at the time or adult observers at the time was how cultish uh, adolescent socialization seemed to be. And that was somewhat unsettling. Now, 
I should note at this point as well that the general sense of ambivalence that, so, that was associated with American teenagers at this time was largely dependent upon both the whiteness and the middle class status of many of these teenagers. So young people of color um, and those from either migrant or working class communities were more likely to be condemned as delinquents or seen as social problems. So they lacked that kind of ambivalence. White, white kids from middle class backgrounds, yes, they were troublemakers, but also they were America's youth, the promise of a better tomorrow. Kids who came from working class backgrounds or ethnic minorities, they were generally seen as just problems. So they lacked that, um, that general ambivalence. So for the most part though, teenagers in the late 1940s and the 1950s were both, a, were both a source of fascination and worry for the adults around them. And that, that applies to teenagers in general. However, teenage girls more specifically posed both a social and a definitional problem. People weren't quite sure how to categorize them. They weren't quite sure how to talk about them. So for instance, as pubescent women, as pubescent girls, they possessed both the capability and the desire to explore their sexuality. But as high school students, they were unconstrained by institutions like marriage and motherhood. So there was a fear about concerning the possibly or the possible implications of unrestrained uh, teenage female sexuality in particular. Teenage girls were also generally presented as, or certainly in popular culture, as being extremely cliquish, even more so than boys of their age, and more beholden to bizarre social rituals and intense and obsessive friendships. So an example of this, an example of the distinct and somewhat strange way that teenage girls were spoken about can be seen in a Life magazine photo essay from 1941. And this essay was published before the term teenager had even been coined. As I said, that term really emerges around 1944 and the magazine article I'm discussing is from 1941. And this photo essay is really fascinating. It deals with a phenomenon, um, a particular cultural type called the sub-debutante or the sub-deb for short. And the sub-deb, the sub-debutante, was essentially a sort of proto-teenager. It was a way of categorizing young women in particular before the term teenager had been coined or had been popularized. So the author of the piece refers to the sub-debutante as any socially uninitiated but acceptable maiden of 15 to 18 who gallivants around town with the right young people. So the piece itself is a really fascinating read um, and you can find it on Google Books if you wanna read the whole thing because it takes an almost anthropological tone to its study of teenage girls. The author talks about these adolescent girls as if they're describing a previously uncontacted tribe from some remote region of the world or a strange new species of animal. It's, it's very strange. And indeed, there is something of an animalistic tone to the way that these young women are described. The author talking about the, the social activities of these young women, he writes, they swoop in and out of parties in noisy, cohesive gangs. They love open houses where there are plenty of phonograph records, cigarettes and cokes. They never stay home on vacation nights. Their taste in male companionship runs less to steadfast devotion than to a multiplicity of dates and quick turnover, uh, which is really interesting language there, quick turnover. You can see again, these fears about adolescent female sexuality. The world at large means nothing to any of them. The microcosm of their gang is everything. And again, that's emphasizing or displaying a degree of anxiety about the intensity of adolescent peer groups. They speak in a curious lingo of their own, adore chocolate milkshake, milkshakes, collect quantities of quaint dolls and soft squishy animals and drive like bats out of hell. So the term sub-debutante does of course indicate or suggest that one day these girls will be debutantes, they will make their debut in polite society. And as a result it's clear that there are class connotations to the sub-debutante. Sub-debs were usually 
upper middle class or upper class young women. So they were a more specific, more limited group than the later teenager. But the way in which they're described very much prefigures how teenage girls more broadly would be talked about and studied and analyzed in the next decade. They're framed very much as the other, as objects of study, objects of fascination, rather than complex, nuanced thinking subjects. They're very much framed here as well as being superficial, peer orientated, greedy, socially disruptive, and of course, promiscuous. So you can see all of the fears that would later be associated with teenage girls already coalescing around the figure of the sub debutante. And during this period in the 1940s and the 1950s, as the sub debutante transforms into the much broader category of the teenage girl, a lot was written about teenage girls. A lot of magazine articles and newspaper articles, journal studies, a lot was written about them. People were trying to get a grasp on them. What exactly were they? But despite this, there was a sense that trying to talk about the teenage girl, trying to figure out exactly what she was, was incredibly difficult. So, Although the idea of youth as a distinct developmental period has existed for centuries, even in the early modern period, there were discussions about youth as a specific developmental stage often characterized by upheaval or turmoil. The idea of adolescence as a distinct phase is something that kind of comes in at the start of the 20th century with um, studies by the psychologist G. Stanley Hall. So the idea of youth as a separate period has been discussed for a long time. But the teenager and the teenage girl in particular was in the middle part of the 20th century, a new phenomenon. And as a result, the teenage girl lacks an existing language or a conceptual framework through which she can be understood. Womanhood, for instance, has a series of pre-existing associations that have accrued around it over the centuries. Womanhood has been associated with a range of figures from the virginal maiden to the lascivious whore to the devoted mother and pretty much everything in between. And likewise, childhood has its own series of associations. Since around the late 17th century and especially later on in the hands of the romantics, Childhood becomes associated with ideas of innocence, nostalgia, and pre-cultural purity. So both womanhood and childhood had a series of cultural, ingrained cultural associations. There, were, there was an existing language to talk about these states. But adolescent girls, because they were caught between child and woman, were not only framed or understood as liminal, but they lacked these ingrained cultural associations they lacked a language through which they could be discussed and understood. And I think the critic Alison Waller, I think puts this particularly well in her book about adolescence in fantastic realism. She points out that unlike childhood, adolescence does not clearly refer to ideas of innocence, origin, or moral security. And it is located not merely as the other to adulthood, but also as other to childhood. It is a liminal space into which a distinct dichotomy of desires or fears can be projected. So teenage girls at this time were a nascent demographic. They were an unformed demographic and they were without a language, a history or a set of discursive tropes that could be employed to easily articulate their nature or their social role. So this leads us to the question of how do we talk about teenagers? And how do we talk about teenage girls in particular? How do we render them familiar or understandable if we don't have an existing set of tropes or narratives or, um, lang or a cultural language through which to talk about them? And one thing that I argue in my own research is that it is specifically this lexical vacuum, this absence of stable conceptual signifiers through which teenage girls can be understood that results in the emergence of the teen witch 
as a pop cultural icon in the 1940s and, and beyond, the teen which basically swoops in to become a way or to provide a means through which teenage girls can be talked about, conceptualized, and potentially understood. So since American culture lacked a stable set of associations or imaginative figures through which the teenage girl could be understood, in my work, I argue that the teenage witch became one and one of many ways through which the phenomenon of the teenage girl could be conceptualized in the middle part of the 20th century. And as I'm going to show later on, the teenage witch was not the only conceptual framework that was deployed at this time to understand the teenage witch, but she is an important and a culturally pervasive one. So this of course brings us to our next question. Why witches? Why does the teenage witch become one of the means through which teen girls are talked about and understood? What is it about the witch that makes her a particularly suitable figure through which to understand female adolescence? So this means talking a little bit about witches and the history of witchcraft ideas, but very briefly. Um, so, in much the same way that the teenage girl has a very complex prehistory, one that extends back beyond well before the term teenager was even coined, the witch also has a lengthy, and in this case, millennia old history. However, the witch as we know her today, the idea of the um, sinister figure who rides on a broomstick, makes a pact with the devil and employs harmful magic, this vision of the witch really only came into being around the 15th century. And this idea of the witch was referred to as the composite or the cumulative notion of witchcraft because it drew on and it united previously distinct ideas about witchcraft that were drawn from popular folklore, beliefs about heretical sects and, the and theological concepts as well. So the composite stereotype of the witch that emerges around the 15th century frames the witch as someone who employs harmful magic or malefica through the aid of the devil with, with whom she's made, the, made a pact. And these two things, a pact with the devil and the use of harmful magic, these were the key things that defined the witch around this period. And obviously as part of this pact, the witch agreed not only to serve the devil, but also to worship him often collectively in large gatherings called Sabbaths. And in various accounts of the Sabbath, witches flew to these meetings on the backs of animals, on poles, on rods, and of course on brooms. So obviously these days, most historians agree that many of these early modern notions about witchcraft, they had little basis in reality, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that these weren't based in any kind of tangible reality, because what does matter is that witchcraft beliefs were a vibrant and a meaningful part of the period's cultural and intellectual life. And what was particularly interesting about witchcraft beliefs, even in the early modern period, is that they were generally used as a framework through which to understand and talk about the wider world. Witchcraft beliefs, ideas about witchcraft were regularly employed as part of debates about seemingly unrelated concepts like religion, science, politics, and history. And in his wonderful book, Thinking with Demons, Stuart Clark points out that the subject of witchcraft seems to have been used as a means for thinking through problems that originated elsewhere and that had little or nothing to do with the legal prosecution of witches. So similarly, uh, the historian Charles Zika points out that the early modern witch could be put to a wide range of different conceptual uses. He points out that representations of witchcraft could support calls for a reform of the moral order, stimulate anxieties over female sexuality, a perennial favorite, support the articulation of male fantasies, forefront the moral lessons of classical literature, reinforce the power of scriptural precedence, strengthen secular authorities in the disciplining of their states, interpret social crimes as signs of divine displeasure, and help incorporate the new world into the cultural frameworks of the old. 
So the witch was a very busy figure during the modern period. She had to perform a lot of different conceptual functions. So what I'm basically pointing to here is the fact that the witch has a long history of acting as a kind of conceptual scaffolding, a means through which distinct and sometimes unrelated problems could be understood and thought through. So even during the early modern period, when witches were very much a real, almost tangible aspect of social reality, the witch was still used as a means through which to conceptualize a whole range of distinct issues. And this is a role that I think the witch continued to play. American texts, for example, that were written between the late 18th and the early 19th century framed historical witch trials as an allegory for the dangers of ignorance and superstition. Early feminists also put the witch to a diverse range of conceptual uses. Matilda Jocelyn Gage in her iconic work of first, first wave feminist discourse, Woman, Church and State from 1893, she uses the figure of the witch as a means through which to explore women's powerlessness and women's abuse within a patriarchal society. So basically the witch has a long history as a malleable imaginative construct, a means of conceptualizing, as I said, distinct and sometimes unrelated concepts. And this, I would argue, is a role that she continues to play well into the post-war period. So in the 1940s and in the 1950s, imagining the teenage girl as the well-known culturally ubiquitous figure of the witch enabled Americans at that time to render familiar this strange new phenomenon of the teen girl. By connecting her to a well-known cultural archetype, the witch, it made this strange new figure more familiar, more understandable, more accessible to a degree. And so in this sense, the teenage witch very much functions as a trope in the sense of the term deployed by the historian Hayden White. And used in both literature and historical writing, tropes are devices like um, synecdoche, irony, metaphor, that authors generally use in order to evoke certain thoughts and responses in their readership. So White claims that Understanding is a process of rendering the familiar or the uncanny in Freud's sense of that term. Uh, sorry, White claims that understanding is a process of, of rendering the unfamiliar or the uncanny in Freud's sense of the term familiar, of removing it from the domain of things felt to be exotic and unclassified into one or another domain of experience encoded adequately enough to be felt to be humanly useful, non-threatening or simply known by association. This process of understanding can only be tropological in nature for what is involved in the rendering of the unfamiliar into the familiar is a troping that is regularly figurative. So in his book, Tropics of Discourse, White basically explains that new modes of understanding, new modes of conceptualizing unfamiliar ideas are ushered into being by literary and conceptual devices that establish often unexpected connections between different concepts and generate iconic images based on these connections, based on these um, bridges that they built between seemingly distinct ideas. So we can say then that as a trope, the teenage witch makes the familiar figure of the teenage girl familiar by associating it with the well-known figure of the witch. Now, although I am arguing that the teenage witch is a trope that functions to usher in or to usher the teenage girl into the realm of what is known, what can be understood, other pop cultural images from the time period did serve a very similar purpose. Mary Celeste Kearney, whose work I draw on quite extensively in terms of framing the witch as a cultural trope, 
she makes the point that in advertising and on television from the middle part of the 20th century, the ubiquitous image of the chatty young girl gossiping on the telephone, it served a similar tropological purpose. Kearney writes that rather than approaching the girl on the phone as a commonly recurring image that merely reflected American girls' communicative practices in the mid 20th century, it should be analyzed as a trope, a discursive formation that signaled and helped to mediate a significant transition in how the teenage girl was being conceptualized during this period. So much like the teen witch, the image of the girl on the phone was not a reflection of adolescent femininity as it actually was, rather it was an attempt to make adolescent femininity comprehensible to the wider American public. So for Kearney, the recurring image of the girl on the telephone, it doesn't reflect teenage girls as they actually are, but instead it enables American culture to understand them as playful, disobedient, and sometimes threatening creatures who straddle the boundary between liberation and containment, childhood and womanhood. So while the teenage witch is not the only trope used at this time in order to render familiar the strange creature that is the teenage girl, it is, I think, one of the most important. And I'm going to finish this section here for now because in the next one, I'm going to talk about one of the texts that, as I said, I see as being instrumental in constructing the adolescent witch as an archetype. So at this point, if anyone has any questions, I know there's been stuff in the chat, but I haven't looked at it because I don't trust myself to talk and read at the same time. Um, apparently that kind of multitasking is beyond me, but um, I'm sure that people do have things they want to say or chime in with. So um, I will open the floor. Um, so. At this point, then, I want to shift my focus to a specific text and one that anachronistically conflates the young women at the center of the 1692 Salem witch trials and mid-century teenagers. And that text is Marion L. Starkey's book, The Devil in Massachusetts, A Modern Inquiry into the Salem Witch Trials. And it's a fascinating text. It was massively influential in the middle part of the 20th century, and then it sort of fell out of view, um, even though, as, as I'm going to show, it influenced a lot of mid-century interpretations of witchcraft and particularly the relationship between witchcraft and adolescence. So in The Devil in Massachusetts, which is a historical study, it's not a work of fiction, it is um, an attempt at a contemporary modern analysis of the Salem witch trials uh, that takes into account uh, psychoanalytical perspectives and also attempts to tie the Salem witch trials into the then recent um, Holocaust and also the um, nascent McCarthy era. So it is, um, it's, a it's a really, really fascinating text. And in particular, what I find interesting about it, and in particular, what I can try to connect or what I try to draw out in this book is how Starkey essentially attributes the Salem witchcraft panic. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna be using terms that are kind of problematic in relation to the, the Salem witch trials, um, occasionally terms like panic, um, which, you know, again, suggests that it's irrational. And I'm very much aware that within the context of the early modern period and the ideological and theological framework of that period, that of course, it's not irrational, but the way it's framed in Starkey's book is very much as a panic. She often refers to it as a hysteria. So some of those terms are probably going to slip into my discussion of it as well. But in The Devil in Massachusetts, Starkey frames the Salem witchcraft panic as largely the product of the hormonal delusions of what she calls a pack of bobby soxers. So Starkey's an interesting person. She was a journalist and a teacher, and she was also a graduate of the Harvard School of Education. So she was a highly educated woman. And as I said, even though the devil in Massachusetts is not very well remembered today, it was at the time one of the most influential studies of the Salem witch trials. But I would argue though, that the devil in Massachusetts is as much an attempt to comprehend the modern phenomenon of the teenage girl as it is an analysis of the Salem witch trials themselves. Because Starkey constructs 
her understanding of the young women and the girls at the center of the outbreak through the lens of modern social concerns about the behavior and the destructive potential of America's newly visible teenage population. And this concern with particularly female adolescents um, is signaled even paratextually in the blurb featured on the first edition of um, Starkey's book. So the blurb that we get on the dust jacket of the first edition reads, because of the fantasies and hysterical antics of unbalanced teenagers, decent men and women were sent to the gallows. So Starkey very much frames them um, in her own writing. Um, it's also in the blurb, which was presumably produced by someone else, but she also frames them in her own writing as being very much um, modern teenagers. And it's very anachronistic, which I think is one of the most fascinating aspects of the book. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the Salem witch trials. I think they're a fairly ubiquitous um, historical event at this point. Um, but obviously anyone familiar with the Salem trials will of course know that teenagers and young girls did play an important role in the trials and in the accusations. Uh, the events that would ultimately lead to the execution by hanging of 19 people and the pressing to death of one began with the alleged bewitchment of two young girls, nine-year-old Betty Paris and 11-year-old Abigail Williams, both of whom were children residing in the home of the village's minister, Samuel Paris. And as the affliction spread, as the bewitchment spread, a number of other young women and girls claimed that they were bewitched, that they were being harassed by spectral forces. And among those were a number of women and girls in adolescence or early adulthood. So you have people like girls like Mercy Lewis, who was 19, Mary Warren, who was 20, Abigail Hobbs, my favorite um, of the, the Salem girls, who was 14, Elizabeth Hubbard, who was 16, and Anne Putnam Jr., who was only 12. And the thing about the Salem witch trials is that although adult women and numerous men were involved and in fact claimed to be bewitched, claimed to be afflicted by spectral forces, it is the Salem girls, it is the girls and the young women that most of us remember today and who are very much centralized in most pop culture representations or historical works about the trials. So Starkey, for her part, lays the blame for the Salem witchcraft panic almost entirely with the young women whom she describes as, and this is a direct quote, crazed little girls. So Starkey becomes one of the first, and I would maintain one of the most significant writers to conflate contemporary constructions of female adolescence with the figure of the witch. And I think her, the unique thing about Starkey's book is how she renders the Salem girls in the new language of teen fads that had grown up in the post-war period. So she is using a self-consciously specifically modern language and a specifically modern construction of female adolescence to talk about the Salem girls. So in her attempt to trace the origins of the Salem witch trials, Starkey claims quite early in the book that the tragedy which was once enacted in this pleasant neighborhood originated in the childish fantasies of some very little girls and was carried to its deadly climax by what one might now call a pack of bobby soxers, were not the term pictorially incongruous. It was largely the older girls who, inflamed by the terrors of Calvinism as their immature minds understood it, depressed by the lack of any legitimate outlet for their natural high spirits, found relief for their tensions in an emotional orgy which eventually engulfed not only their village, but the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So the two things to take away from here really are, firstly, her use of the term bobby soxers, which I'll come back to in a second, and the weirdly hormonal sexual language that she uses. The girl, you know, outlet for their natural high spirits, relief for their tensions, emotional orgy. So there's a lot of emphasis on repressed, um, adolescent sexuality and adolescent sexual frustration, which she becomes even more explicit about later on. But the use of the term Bobby Soxer is very much crucial here because the term Bobby Soxer 
is one that would have been intimately familiar to contemporary readers. And it's a term that would have evoked a whole range of cultural associations with youth, irresponsibility, and adolescent rebellion. So I'm sure most of you are aware of this term already. It's, you know, it's obviously fallen out of fashion now, but it's, it's used in a lot of media um, set during this period. But the term bobby socks are basically derives from the style of socks. You can see them here in the picture worn by female fans of swing music in the 1940s. And I think what's interesting about the fact that the term Bobby Soxer was used to talk about these teen girls is that even in their earliest incarnation, teenage girls are reduced to a product. They're reduced to a commodity. Um, the term Bobby Soxer is very much a signifier of their perceived frivolous preoccupation with fashion and with popular trends. So, Bobby Soxers are kind of the, the ultimate ambivalent teenage girl because they embody both youthful promise and rebellion, the threat of adolescent rebellion. And <clears throat> Bobby Soxers were very much framed as being disruptive in their sexuality and fanatical in their devotion to boys that they might know who they would have crushes on and movie stars <clears throat> and other celebrities. I'm getting forced, hang on a second. And Starkey's characterization of the Salem girls very much parallels these anxieties. So just as the pleasant neighborhood of Salem, which is such a weird way to talk about, you know, a 17th century village, it intentionally makes it sound like a nice American suburb of the middle part of the 20th century. So just as the pleasant neighborhood of Salem was brought to ruin or to the edge of ruin by the natural high spirits of these frustrated Puritan girls. So too did post-war American adults worry that their pleasant suburban neighborhoods might be destroyed by the uncontainable energies of adolescent girls. Now, some very creepy imagery here. Um, so in this way, I think Starkey's book reflected common concerns about the disruptive potential of teenage girls, concerns that were very much present in the popular imagination at this time. So we get contemporary films, films that would have been released just a few years before Starkey's book, like Junior Miss, which you can see here in the, the still with the, the girl applying makeup, and Kiss and Tell. Both of these films are from 1945. And in these books, or in these films, sorry, teenage girls are portrayed as flighty, irresponsible, um, strange in a way creatures who are obsessed with popular singers and Hollywood heartthrobs. And they're frequently depicted as susceptible to flights of fantasy, usually Hollywood or TV um, or you know, media inspired flights of fantasy that over the course of the films pro prove immensely destructive to both their families and their communities. And Ilana Nash, who has a whole wonderful book about this, she talks about how in numerous cinematic texts featuring Bobby Soxer, these girls are constructed as, quote, silly creatures who cause astronomical, if accidental, damage to their father's stability, end quote. So in these works, by jeopardizing their father's careers, their finances, and their social standing, these girls pose a threat to the hierarchy of patriarchal authority. Again, not intentionally, they're not figured as, you know, socially conscious rebels. They, they cause destruction unintentionally because they are susceptible to daydreams, they're superficial, they're boy crazy, and that is what proves destructive. So characterizing the young women of Salem as unique or as equally susceptible to boredom and mischief and imaginative flights of fantasy, Starkey is very much drawing on a store of common concerns about the American teenager. And although Starkey goes to a great deal of effort to present the Bobby Soxer as socially disrupt, um, disruptive, she also grounds the teenage girl's potentially destructive nature in her hormones and in her burgeoning sexuality. So Starkey describes, for instance, and again, she's using very much modern language. She describes how 
There was in the village of Salem, uh, there was in Salem village in the winter of 1691 to 1692, quite a store of young girls, unattached teenagers. The Puritans, sober in all things, quite properly looked on marriage as a serious business and did not favor it for the very young. Thus, there were several girls who had reached the age of 16, 17, and even 20, still manless and unprovided for. And those girls were instinct with repressed vitality, with all manner of cravings and urges for which village life afforded no outlet. So for Starkey, the Salem girls are firstly motivated by typical adolescent boredom. Um, but they are also, and the, um, but they are also described as manless. They are single girls with no outlet for their burgeoning sexuality. And according to Starkey, it is this repressed sexual energy that has no outlet, nowhere for it to go, that causes them to hallucinate witches and specters and to imagine that they're being pricked by invisible pins and bitten by specters and so on. This she attributes entirely almost to sexual repression, repressed desires and urges that have nowhere to go, have no outlet. So the Salem girls for Starkey, the girls who inaugurated the witch trials, are defined by their liminal status, both culturally, they're a store of manless, I love that phrase, young women on the periphery of their community, but they're also liminal in a corporeal sense because they are positioned between childhood and womanhood. And Starkey's preoccupation with the unfulfilled urges of the Salem girls is very much significant here, I think, because it's not really reflective of Puritan ideas about youth. I mean, yes, as we said earlier, the early modern period did possess a conception of youth as a distinct period, but this idea of hormonal teenage girls overcome by repressed sexuality, that's far more in keeping with mid 20th century ideas about puberty and the female body. And this is where we get to talk about mid 20th century puberty discourses and educational material, which is so much fun. Um, so in the middle part of the 20th century, popular ideas about puberty and menarche were centered very much on the idea of uncontrollable hormones. And throughout the 1940s and the 1950s, sex education material aimed at adolescent girls very much emphasized the unruly nature of the pubertal body and it outlined the steps that could and should be taken to control its hormones as well as its various seepages and disturbances. And one of my favorite examples of weird mid-century sex education is the story of menstruation. It's a short animated sex education video for girls uh, created by Walt Disney of all companies, which is very strange. And this film, uh, which I recommend everyone watch, by the way, it's on YouTube, it's like 15 minutes long, and it is just straight, simultaneously strange and kind of depressing. But it basically imagines the onset of puberty as an eruption of hormonal chaos that young women must struggle to control. And it frames the body as kind of leaky and porous. And it doesn't say this outright, but the implication is that the female body is characterized by these seeping fluids and these uncontrollable hormones that need to be controlled for the good of the social order. It also imagines the teenage girl as volatile and emotional. You can see here in the, the bottom right hand, this girl who is in front of a mirror um, looking very dejected. And this film goes to great lengths to basically tell young girls, around your menstrual period, you are going to be hormonal, you are going to be sad, you are going to be down in the dumps, but for the love of God, do your hair, put on your makeup and put on a cheery expression because you need to hide this. You need to suppress this emotional, biological and hormonal turmoil. You cannot allow anyone to catch a glimpse of this. You need to look cheery, look happy, suppress any emotional difficulties you might be having, suppress any pain you're in. That's kind of the subtext, or I guess it's practically text, really. Uh, it's not a very subtle uh, film. So the fi this film very much frames pubertal girls as volatile and emotional, and that these things, these hormonal um, eruptions need to be controlled. 
and it encourages teenage girls to very much repress any negative emotions they might feel surrounding their menstrual period, to pay close attention to their personal grooming, and to ensure that they adopt, again, a cheerful attitude so that, you know, no one gets a sense of the hormonal tumult that is bubbling away beneath the surface. So the idea, though, that women and girls need to pay careful attention to their bodies and contain its fluids and its odors as well as any negative emotions. This was ubiquitous during this period and to a degree it still is. Um, in her study of mid-20th century puberty pamphlets for girls, Michelle H. Martin, for example, discusses the ubiquity of references to containment in these texts, remarking that a consistent theme in throughout the puberty pamphlets from Kimberly Clark, the makers of Kotex products, personal products, makers of Always brand sanitary products and Modes, and Tam brands, makers of Tampax, is that although the old menstruation is perfectly natural, women must pay special attention to their body odor, particularly while menstruating. So there's this idea that the biological aspects of femininity, particularly adolescent femininity, need to be suppressed, they need to be hidden, they need to be contained for the good of the social order. By the way, I picked this um, particular ad intentionally because there's a whole series of them. And in most of them, the girls are doing like fairly normal things. You know, they're skiing, they're riding a bike, they're going to a dance. But I just love this one because the woman is frolicking with lambs. Like ordinarily your period would present, prevent you from effectively frolicking with barnyard animals. But like if you use our products, you can do that. It's just such a weird advert, so I love it. Um, so in adverts and in educational material, as well as in popular culture from this period, teenage girls are very much framed as inhabiting the border between biology and culture. And they're very much tasked with um, mediating this boundary, ensuring that biology never intrudes on the social realm. And Starkey's view of the Salem girls as you know, being unable to control this hormonal and sexual excess, which she you know, euphemistically phrases as repressed vitality. For her, this is essential. This is central to the Salem witch trials, this inability to control or suppress the biological or to control or suppress sexual urges. So a few pages later, Starkey is even more explicit in her attribution of the Salem panic to teenage hormonal excess. And describing 12 year old Anne Putnam Jr. who many of you will know was one of the most prolific accusers during the Salem witch trials, Starkey writes that Anne was now on the verge of adolescence, already subject to the preliminary strains of that difficult period, to unexplained pains and heaviness in the limbs, to dizziness and flashes of imagination so vivid that they sometimes resemble hallucinations. So Starkey is basically directly attributing Anne's vision of witches, her, you know, her belief that she was being harassed by witches, that she was being picked and bitten and pinched. Uh, Starkey very much attributes this directly to adolescence, to the experience of puberty, to the physical strains and the lethargy associated with puberty. So The Devil in Massachusetts is very much an important text because it connects the Salem witch trials and the panic or the you know, hysteria associated with it to both the social liminality of teenage girls and to the hormonal upheavals of, pure, of puberty. And if for, in doing so, it forges a connection between teenage girls and witchcraft that I think will become increasingly important during this period. So of course, this obviously brings us to one kind of important issue the Salem girls aren't witches. They accuse people of witchcraft, but they're not witches, with the exception of Abigail Hobbs, who did initially confess to, um, to witchcraft before um, becoming a, a key accuser herself. But for the most part, the Salem girls were not really witches. They accused people of witchcraft and they sent, you know, according to Starkey, many people to their deaths, but they weren't actually witches. And this is true. However, in Starkey's account, there is considerable slippage in how she categorizes the witches and the afflicted girls, so that the afflicted girls, the accusers, are regularly subsumed within the category of the witch. So, and Starkey stresses um, a number of times in the book 
how the girls were held up by their community as being uniquely attuned to the supernatural. She points out that they were viewed by their community as having a special, almost miraculous ability to detect the presence of witches. And she points out that they were capable of divining the presence of witches and invisible specters. Obviously, this is, you know, part of the, the you know, the historical event itself. The girls were kind of looked to for their ability to detect witches. But Starkey really emphasizes this. And throughout the book, she uses, again, anachronistic language to talk about this. She refers to them as seeresses, as mediums. She also suggests, and this is somewhat inaccurate based on the, the historical evidence that I've been able to, to unearth um, or to, to gather, um, she also suggests that resentful Salem villagers referred to their accusers, referred to the girls as witches. So she claims, for instance, and this is a direct quote from Starkey, that bitch witches was the word old George Jacobs had for the, the afflicted girls. That incidentally is where the, the title of this presentation comes from. Um, but this is actually a misreading of the evidence because the girls were never really collectively described in this way. There was um, an instance when after being accused by his maidservant, Mary, or sorry, that should be Sarah Church, well, not Sarah, not, um, not Mary. I don't know why the title there. I'll fix it for the next one. Um, Sarah Churchwell or Churchill in some sources. Um, there is evidence that an elderly man called George Jacobs referred to her as bitch witch and other ill names, but this was never really a collective term employed for the girls. So despite being grounded in historical inaccuracies in this case, Starkey's work, I think, was nevertheless responsible for creating this enduring popular connection between teenage girls and witches. And this is something that will be developed later by subsequent writers, filmmakers, and artists. So I'm going to finish this section here, um, and we're going to look then at some texts, some literary works that were specifically influenced by Starkey's work. I'm also going to fix that typo. OK, so following on from Starkey, so as I said earlier, uh, the Devil in Massachusetts was definitely one of the most influential 20th century studies of the Salem Witch Trials. Um, again, it's not very well remembered today, or not as well remembered as it should be, I think, because it's, you know, it does a lot of work culturally um, and conceptually. But it influenced a number of fictional portrayals of the Salem Witch Trials, and particularly of the young women at the center of the Salem Witch Trials. Um, William Carlos Williams has a, 19, a play from 1950 called Tichuba's Children, and it's, it's sort of a weird play because it basically treads much of the same ground as Arthur Miller's The Crucible, in that it uses the Salem Witch Trials as a, as a means of critiquing the anti-communist paranoia of the post-war period, but I guess because three years later The Crucible comes along and like basically blows that out of the water, um, no one remembers um, William Carlos Williams' version, which is kind of a shame because it's, it's very different, but again, it's kind of making the same point. And in this play, Tichibus Children, uh, William Carlos Williams actually quotes directly from uh, Starkey's book. He actually has direct quotations from the devil in Massachusetts interspersed throughout the play. And like Starkey, Williams very much flames the Salem afflicted, the teenage girls at the heart of the trials, as these fundamentally disruptive figures, as a threat to the social order. And early in the play, um, we're told that the Salem tragedy occurred, and this is a direct quotation, when a lot of little girls took over the town. Later, a character explains how these young girls transformed into vicious monsters. And again, a direct quote, overnight they grew to oracles, wild ungoverned furies rather of destruction. So you can see hopefully some parallels between some of the earlier cultural discourses about teenage girls, particularly that Life magazine piece that I quoted about the sub debutante, where they're described as being these like almost avian or bird like creatures swooping in and out of parties and driving like bats out of hell. You can kind of see this echoed in um, in William Carlos Williams' work, where he's basically describing them as being kind of animalistic, but also framing them as these supernatural or mystical creatures. 
describes them as oracles or furies. The most well-known text though to draw from Starkey's study is obviously Arthur Miller's The Crucible. And it's most famous obviously as a critique of McCarthyism. But one of the reasons I find it so fascinating is in its representation of teenage girls and in particular, the icon that is Abigail Williams. Um, because she is just fascinating um, in, in Miller's play. I mean, in real life as well, but in Miller's play, she's just an amazing character. So like Starkey, um, I would argue that Miller engages in a lot of the same categorical slippage. Um, the girls themselves, and especially their leader, Abigail Williams, are actually probably the closest thing the play has to witches in terms of how they're described and in terms of their behavior. Like Starkey, Miller also pretty much frames the Salem afflicted, the Salem girls, as a modern teenage clique. The way they behave uh, is very much um, reflective of contemporary representations of teenage girls far more than it is of, you know, the reality of, youth, of Puritan youth. I actually, I once had a student submit an essay where she compared um, the Crucible to Mean Girls, and I feel like it's one of the most accurate things I've ever encountered. It's brilliant. But um, so there is that sort of overlap, that anachronistic representation of the Salem girls in the Crucible. And that very much comes, I think, from Starkey's work. And echoing, I think, Starkey's description of the Salem girls as, you know, manless and instinct with repressed vitality, Miller locates the origin, I think, of the Salem trials, of the accusations in adolescent chaos and frustrated hormonal desire. And Miller is actually pretty explicit about the debt he owes to Marion L. Starkey. He has this essay called The Crucible in History, where he talks about where the idea for the play came from. And he actually says that the idea really crystallized on what he terms the lucky afternoon where he discovered a copy of The Devil in Massachusetts. So he's very um, explicit about the fact that he used Starkey's book as a source. And he does indeed borrow certain elements directly from Starkey's book. Starkey, for instance, attributes Anne Putnam Jr.'s vision of witches and spectral foes to the onset of puberty. Again, there's that quote I gave you early about, earlier about how Anne was now on the verge of adolescence, already subject to the preliminary strains of that difficult period, to unexplained pains and heaviness in the limbs, to dizziness and flashes of imagination so vivid that they sometimes resemble hallucinations. And Miller repeats that almost exactly, or repeats it, or kind of reconfigures it in a way, um, but he, it's very similar anyway to, to, Starkey's, um, to Starkey's description of Anne Putnam Jr. As some of you will know in, um, in The Crucible, for some reason, Anne Putnam Jr. is renamed Ruth. Um, I assume this is to distinguish her from um, her mother, Anne Putnam Sr., who was also heavily involved in the Salem Witch Trials. But in the play anyway, um, Miller describes Ruth or Anne um, as becoming a secret, as a secret child she has become this year and shrivels like a sucking mouth or pulling on her life too. So there's this idea that again, even in the play, this character has become susceptible, has been overtaken by the lethargy, by the physical heaviness, the weight of puberty. Um, so again, there's that connection between the stresses of adolescence and witchcraft iconography and the kind of the birth of these accusations. And like Starkey, Miller also frames the Salem afflicted as being socially liminal, observing that they exist on the borders of society he points out that in this particular culture, young people were expected to walk straight, eyes slightly lowered, arms at the side and mouths shut until bidden to speak. So there's this idea that these young people exist on the parameters of their society. But once the girls, of course, begin accusing their neighbors of witchcraft, they move from the periphery to the center of their community and everyone listens to them. They become the center of their community. Miller also presents the girls as displaying the kind of tribalism, the kind of group mentality that was associated with teenage girls during this period. If you think back to our discussion earlier um, of the, the researcher in a Midwestern high school who talks about how these groups of adolescents, they don't have any formal written rules, but they have sort of an unspoken guide as to how they should behave, who is admitted, and what to do with people who don't quite fit in. 
And you can kind of see some of this um, emerging in Miller's representation of the Salem girls as being sort of enmeshed in a kind of hive mind, a sort of strange group mentality. So for example, when Mary Warren, a young servant girl tries to extricate herself from the accusing circle, Abigail Williams, the leader of the group and the other girls, they respond as if bewitched and they imitate Mary's words and her actions in unison. So when Mary says, Abby, you mustn't, all of the other girls uh, repeat what she said, they echo, Abby, you mustn't. And they repeat everything that she says, even going so far as to mimic her behavior exactly. Um, at the end of this particular passage, for example, um, when Mary just is reduced to whimpering, the other girls whimper and move their bodies in exactly the same way, echoing, mimicking Mary. The girls also, of course, defer to the authority of the group's ostensible leader, Abigail Williams. Um, again, this kind of reflects back to the idea of, you know, these groups as having these unwritten rules and these unwritten guidelines as to how they should behave and who is admitted and so on. So in, essentially, I think in The Crucible, the girls at the center of the Salem trials, they very much embody the worst facets of teenagers as they were imagined during the 1940s and 50s. They're excessively peer orientated, they are petty, and they possess an immense possibility for social disruption. But Miller also very much focuses on the disruptive power of adolescent sexuality. After all, in The Crucible, he presents a very simplistic cause for the Salem witch trials, and that is the jealousy of Abigail Williams. So in, um, in The Crucible, again, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Abigail's age is raised. In reality, she was an 11 year old child. In Miller's version, her age is raised to 17. So she's an adolescent girl. And she is presented as having had a brief but torrid affair with the farmer, John Proctor, who in reality was in his 60s, but in Miller's play, his age is lowered to his 30s. And Abigail is um, presented not only as spiteful and jealous, but as sexual and almost hormonal, almost again in Starkey's terms, instinct with repressed vitality. She tells Proctor, for example, in one scene that I have a sense for heat, John, and yours has drawn me to the window, to my window, and I have seen you looking up burning in your loneliness. So there's this sense of kind of hormonal chaos of sexual desire that needs to be repressed. Um, again, this kind of goes back to some of the educational and advertising materials that we discussed earlier, how they stress the importance of young women repressing their hormonal upheavals and, you know, the dangers of the potential leakiness of the female body. Abigail very much uh, fails to repress her hormonal tumult. She fails to repress her sexual desire. And this is what destroys the community in the end. And Miller is even more explicit during one of his explanatory passages where he talks about the connection between witchcraft panics and the sexual urges of young women in Europe. And he very much blames European witch trials on young women who engage in sexual desires. He says that there are accounts of similar clashes in Europe where the daughters of the town would assemble at night and sometimes with fetishes sometimes with a selected young man, give themselves over to, to love with some bastardly results. So like Starkey, I think Miller also repeatedly figures the accusing circle, the girls at the center of the trials, not so much as victims, but as witches in their own right. By the way, incidentally, the image I'm using here is from the, I think it was 2016 Broadway revival of The Crucible, where the costume and the set, costuming and set design um, place the events in a boarding school. And I think that's really interesting because it's a sort of in, anachronistic representation of the Salem witch trials, you know, putting them in a boarding school. But at the same time, Miller's work, like Starkey's, is inherently anachronistic in its construction of the Salem girls as modern teenagers. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting artistic choice. But I think that, like Starkey, Miller also represents the accusing circles, the girls at the center of the trials, not so much as victims, but almost as witches in their own right. And I think Abigail Williams, and this might be why I love her so much, 
is presented as being a spiteful, obsessively jealous teen witch. Because in The Devil in Massachusetts, Starkey relies on anecdotal evidence that has largely been disproven about the girl's involvement in fortune telling and divination. And Miller very much extrapolates from Starkey's version of events to position the girls as partaking in witchcraft, in magical rituals of their own. And Abigail in The Crucible is explicitly associated with the occult. Her uncle, Reverend Paris, has observed her dancing like a heathen in the forest. She engages in the kinds of magical practices that would have been denounced as witchcraft by her community. Her uncle accuses her as having trafficked with spirits in the forest. And her younger cousin, Betty, when she awakens from her paralysis, describes or points out that Abigail went to the forest and drank a charm to kill John Proctor's wife. And we're also told that Abigail, in a sort of perversion of the Lord's Supper, apparently drank blood as part of this charm. And there, there is that scene where, you know, Betty reminds her, you know, you drank blood, Abby. So there is that, again, that association um, between Abigail and witchcraft. Um, and later on, when Betty attempts to speak of this, when Betty reminds Abigail of the rituals that she's performed, Abigail threatens the child and tells her if she dares mention this to anyone, if she dares mention to anyone the fact that these girls were participating in, you know, occult rituals in the woods, she tells Abigail, or she tells Betty, I will bring a pointy reckoning that will shudder you, and you know I can do it. I saw Indians smash my dear parents' heads on the pillow next to me, and I have seen some reddish work done at night, and I can make you wish you'd never seen the sun go down. So although Abigail's um, proxy, or sorry, although it's uh, proximity to Abigail's description of her parents' murder um, suggests that her knowledge of violence comes from her experiences as a refugee from the Second Indian War, which was at the time raging on the main frontier, the term reddish work evokes imagery of blood magic, such as the charm that Abigail drank to um, harm Goody Proctor. So Abigail is associated with blood, with red, and with heat. And consequently, she's associated with feminine excess that threatens to spill over and infect the social order. And again, I think this takes us back to those post-war figurations, those post-war representations of female adolescence as defined by the threat of seepage, of odors and fluids that must be contained, and also the impetus the impetus on teenage girls to learn how to control their bodies, how to repress their urges, their hormones, their seepages, all for the good of the social order. So Abigail's connection to blood and to reddish work suggests a sort of subversive femininity in which the corporeal and the biological is not repressed for the sake of the social order. So, in the years following the publication of The Devil in Massachusetts, and of course the debut of The Crucible, there were numerous texts published uh, in which teen witches, young women with supernatural powers, are employed as a fictive trope through which to explore the potentially disruptive nature of adolescent sexuality, um, as well as the power of female adolescence to disrupt both society and the family. So Ray Bradbury's The April Witch, for example, was published in a 1952 issue of the Saturday Evening Post, so just before The Crucible. And it features a 17-year-old witch with the power of astral projection. And she can send her body, or sorry, she can send her spirit or her essence out of her body. Um, and she can possess other animals and people. And again, it kind of ties into that idea of the uncontainable nature of the female body, this idea of fluids and desires that sort of seep out. And in this story, the April witch, her name is Cece, she uses her power to take over the body of a slightly older girl um, in order to explore female sexuality. She possesses this girl so she can go to a dance with a boy and she can kiss him and just, you know, explore um, adult female sexuality. And in, it's interesting actually, because in John Eller's recent biography of Ray Bradbury, 
he actually points out that Ray Bradbury bought a copy of The Devil in Massachusetts in the late 1940s. Uh, Bradbury was actually descended from a woman named Mary Bradbury of Salisbury, Massachusetts, who was accused of witchcraft during the Salem witch trials. And he did apparently, you know, he apparently was interested in his family roots because he bought a copy, as I said, of the devil in Massachusetts in the late 1940s. So he was obviously familiar with Starkey's representation of the teenage witch. We also, of course, get other more sensational representations of the teen witch in later works like Lois Duncan's Summer of Fear and Jessica Hamilton or Ken Greenhall's um, um, book Elizabeth, uh, a novel of the unnatural. The author was actually a man named Ken Greenhall, but he published under the name Jessica Hamilton. And in these works, Elizabeth and Summer of Fear, teen witches are very much portrayed as sinister figures as disruptive figures and particularly figures who bring harm to the family unit who destabilize or undermine patriarchal authority and therefore damage the family unit however and this is the kind of one of the last points i want to make for today um this isn't the only purpose that teen witches served at the time. They weren't just figured as these disruptive, potentially dangerous, excessive figures. They weren't just a means also of helping adults figure out adolescent femininity. They were sometimes created as a kind of template, a model upon which teenage girls could explore, develop and expand their own identities. And this is my last kind of section for today. Um, I want to look at this idea of the teen witch as a role model, as a desirable identity. And the two texts I'm going to talk about during the last few minutes of this talk are Elizabeth George Spears' young adult novel, The Witch of Blackbird Pond, which was published in 1958, and the early comics featuring the character of Sabrina Spellman, uh, who was created by Archie Comics in 1962. And in these works, the teen witch is not just a means of projecting fears or of conceptualizing adolescence. She becomes a model through which teen readers can explore their own identity and figure out who they are, develop a sense of self. They're also a means through which teenage girls, teenage readers can become, can be sort of inducted into socially desirable identities and values. So, the Witch of Blackbird Pond, as I said, was published in 1958, and it was very much written in response to contemporary concerns about juvenile delinquency. So at this time, the behavior of teenagers was very much a cause for concern. In fact, it was such a cause for concern that FBI director J. Edgar Hoover claimed that juvenile delinquency was a threat to American life on a par with communism. So people were very anxious about teenagers and their behavior. Spears' book, however, The Witch of Blackbird Pond, is very much a critique of this moral panic because it shows teenagers and particularly teenage girls as morally and emotionally complex figures, figures who are capable of growth and maturation over time. So like the Crucible and like the Witch of Blackbird Pond, or sorry, like the Crucible, the Witch of Blackbird Pond is a work of historical fiction. Though it's not set in Massachusetts, it's set in 17th century Connecticut. And it follows the story of a girl called Kit Tyler. She's a spoiled, quite willful 16 year old who grew up in Barbados uh, at that time a British colony where she was raised by her liberal indulgent grandfather. However, Upon his death, she's sent to live in Connecticut with her strict Puritan aunt and uncle. And Kit begins this story as a spoiled, um, materialistic girl. She brings trunks full of rich clothing and she is resentful when she's asked to help with chores. Um, however, she's also independent and she's self-sufficient. The townspeople begin to suspect her of witchcraft when she dives into the harbor to, to rescue a toy that has been dropped by a child. And the townspeople express this belief that, of course, women shouldn't swim and only a witch could stay afloat in the water in the way that Kit does. She's later tried for witchcraft after she befriends a local Quaker woman and teaches a neglected child how to read. So again, reading like swimming is associated with witchcraft. 
So in this case, Kit is not actually a witch, of course. She's not, she doesn't possess any magical powers or ability or abilities. She's labeled a witch largely because of her refusal to conform to the social norms of her community. However, for teen readers at this time, um, and particularly in this text, the identity of witch is framed as desirable because Kit is accused of being a witch precisely because of her failure to conform, because of her compassion and because of her intelligence. So being a witch is here associated with positive traits that young women might want to emulate as they grow, over, grow older. And over the course of the narrative, Kit transforms from a self-centered and spoiled girl into a socially conscious, altruistic young woman. And readers are expected to follow or to emulate this evolution. And the story ends very optimistically when Kit, over the course of her trial, convinces the town magistrate that America as the new world is a place of change and therefore it's acceptable for a girl or a woman to read or to swim. So Kit is very much associated with mid-century liberal values, with progressivism, with um, education and with altruism. So in The Witch of Blackbird Pond, the teenage witch essentially serves a pedagogical function. Um, she is a model for readers in terms of how to develop their behavior, their attitudes, and their role within the community. So this, of course, does tie into some of the historical functions of um, both children's literature and young adult fiction as it was emerging in the late 1950s, because one of the functions of literature for young people is, of course, education and the imparting of socially desirable lessons and ideas. So young people are often encouraged um, in these kinds of novels to identify with the text's protagonists and to adopt their values. So young adult fiction often serves as a space where young people can explore their identities and also learn the kinds of competencies that will be expected of them in the adult world. So the audience who originally read The Witch of Blackbird Pond in the 1950s and the 1960s would have learned from Kit's experiences that growing up and becoming a woman requires the acquisition of modesty and a responsible attitude. But they would also have learned that it requires courage, conviction, and compassion. And this, of course, backs up some recent studies about the audience reception of young adult fiction. In interviews conducted by Jessica Kokesh and Milena Sternadorni Dory in the, ninth, in the early 2000s, um, they investigated how adolescent identity formation is influenced by young adult fiction. And after interviewing a number of young people, particularly young girls, the authors discovered that teenage readers often tend to employ young adult novels as a guide to life. And they also discovered that when reading these books, teenagers often engage in a process of identification whereby they receive and understand the texts from the inside as if events were happening to them. They read and interpret the text from the inside. And this kind of identification they go on to explain is one of the main mechanisms through which people develop their social attitudes and construct their identities. So the witch in this case becomes a model through which teen girls can explore their identities and develop uh, socially desirable attitudes and values. And we get a similar thing with the early Sabrina comics. The title character models an ideal version of adolescent femininity that the comics creators want their readers to emulate. Sabrina, however, uh, models a version of young adulthood centered on popularity, on beauty, and on diligent consumerism. So the character of Sabrina Spellman debuted in Archie's Madhouse, issue 22, in October of 1962. And Sabrina is, as I'm sure most of you know, a teenage witch who lives with her aunts Hilda and Zelda, and of course her familiar Salem.
But unlike her aunts, who in the early comics are depicted as traditional Halloween witches with long pointy noses and pointy hats and all of that, Sabrina is an ordinary teenage girl, or she's, she's drawn as an ordinary teenage girl. She obviously has magical powers. But in her first appearance, she is notably drawn wearing fashionable clothes and surrounded by the accoutrements of affluent post-war adolescents. So this is her first appearance. Um, you can see it here in the slide. She has her hair done in a fashionable style. She's wearing a trendy outfit. She's watching television. She has a record player going in the background. She has magazines and comics on the floor. She's surrounded by all of the accoutrements of post-war adolescents, media, music, fashionable clothing. And when she introduces herself to the reader, she plays rather intentionally with popular ideas about witchcraft. She says, hi, my name is Sabrina. I hope I haven't disappointed you. I mean, I hope you didn't expect to find me living on some dreary mountaintop, wearing some grubby old rags and making some nasty old brew. Instead, Sabrina explains to her readers that modern young witches are fashionable and fun-loving. She tells readers, we modern witches believe that life should be a ball. So Sabrina's magic in the early comics, in the period from the early 60s to the early 70s, is very much aligned or directed towards materialistic aims. And she's closely aligned with the ethos of the Archie comics from which she emerged. So Archie comics, just briefly, was initially established as MLJ comics in the late 1930s. And the characters that the company is most famous for, Archie, Betty and Veronica, Jughead, they were created in 1941 to capitalize on the popularity of teen movies like Life Begins for Andy Hardy and Love Finds Andy Hardy. But the Archie comics were popular not just because they mirrored or echoed the tropes of early teen cinema, but also because of what Louisa Colon describes as Archie's peculiar dichotomy, an obedient adherence to cultural norms coupled with the ability to successfully evolve. Essentially, Archie and his friends, while they change with the times, at least superficially, their clothes are updated, the kind of music they listen to, their interests, these things are all modernized. Um, while they change with the times and they reflect popular teen trends, they never push beyond the parameters of conventional American values. And this is echoed in an outline that was provided by Archie Enterprises. Archie Andrews, the, the title character, is described as an assertive, optimistic, conventional person who is unquestioningly loyal to American institutions. So essentially Archie Comics and ultimately Sabrina, they're popular because while the characters are ostensibly fashionable modern teenagers, they never push beyond the boundaries of acceptable American culture. And Sabrina Spellman, who, as I said, has appeared in both solo comics and in Archie comics, she also exemplifies an ethos of fashionable adolescent conformity. In her first appearance, for example, Sabrina tells us that witches are not allowed to fall in love. And in a comic published in 1963, she's actually punished by the head witch for kissing a boy. So Sabrina basically presents herself as a rebel among witches. Uh, unlike her aunts who are ugly hags, she's pretty and popular. She enjoys appropriately chaste mid-century dating practices. She's the opposite of how a witch should be, but be in, the opposite, in being the opposite of how a witch should be, in being a rebel amongst witches, she is essentially a conventional American teenage girl. So the manner in which Sabrina rebels against the strictures of the witch community is by embodying the cultural norms of the early 1960s. And the message promoted by Sabrina comics is one centered on the importance of beauty, popularity, and consumption. So most of Sabrina's adventures involve her using magic in order to procure consumer goods. She sums up a, a closet full of fashionable clothing or instantly conjures up parties for her friends to enjoy. She essentially enacts consumerism as fantasy. And she gets to bask in the instant fulfillment of her desires because 
although the character evolves over the decades, particularly in the 1990s in response to the popularity of the ABC sitcom, in her earliest appearances, Sabrina is presented at, as the teenager, as consumer par excellence. She's the teenager as ideal, voracious, diligent consumer. Any new desires that Sabrina might have are instantly fulfilled. She tells us in one comic that one advantage in being a teen witch is that you don't have to keep a big wardrobe. All you have to do is picture an outfit you like and say abracadabra, shindiga baloo. I can't believe I said that. Um, and there it is. So for Sabrina, there's no waiting. There are no financial constraints. She can immediately summon up the latest fashions and her trendy outfits along with her all American beauty is what makes her so popular amongst her peers. In addition to that, Sabrina's ability to engage in instantaneous consumption is also what attracts and facilitates her many adventures. She plays with Archie's band and she attracts attention when she goes to the beach and has multiple boys fight over her, all because of her power to immediately summon into being the latest consumer goods and popular diversions. So Sabrina not only embodies the notion of the adolescent as a marketing demographic defined by shopping habits and homogenous trends, she makes consumption, conspicuous consumption appear enticing to her readers. She makes it appear desirable. And discussing Disney's use of merchandising in the 1930s, Elizabeth Bullen points out that the conflation of the pleasures of entertainment with the pleasures of consumption is a key mechanism in the enculturation of the young into consumer society. And that's basically what Sabrina does. She's a character whose adventures are regularly incited through her magical attainment of consumer goods. The pleasure of entertainment in the Sabrina comics is intimately bound up with the pleasures of consumerism. So in contrast to the witches of, um, so in contrast to the witches of the crucible, Kit Tyler and Sabrina Spellman are characters who were created not so much for adults to figure out what a teenage girl is or to come up with a way of talking about teenage girls. They were created to appeal specifically to teenage girls. And both of them model figurations of adolescent femininity that readers are encouraged to mimic. While Kit might embody a more nuanced conception of adolescent femininity, growing over the course of the novel from a spoiled child into a socially conscious young woman, Sabrina's characterization does remain relatively static, but she very much exists as a model of female adolescence predicated on beauty, popularity, and consumption. In both cases, though, these texts are essentially pedagogical. In the case of The Witch of Blackbird Pond, Spear is very much trying to inculcate readers into liberal mid-century values of you know, social consciousness, altruism, um, independence, and so on. Whereas in the case of Sabrina, the comics creators are very much trying to teach young women in particular about the value of consumption, of diligent consumerism. So I'm going to finish there for today um, because I, I really just wanted to introduce you um, to, I guess, the origin of the teen witch and some early figurations of the teenage witch. Uh, I'll leave it there for today. Uh, thank you very much. I realize I've gone a bit over time and I'm sorry, but um, thank you all so much for coming along and for listening to me talk about teen witches and where they come from and all of that. So I'm